right. All right. We have, I see DeRoy, Wendy, and Nicole. Uh -huh. Great. I'll wait for you to cue me to go ahead. Um, oh, yeah, I'll, um, I'll actually kick it off, so don't worry. Okay. About All right. that. Yeah. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll just wait. I'll hang tight. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not taking a bit here to connect audio. Is that what you see, too, that they're connecting? Okay. Yes. So it's, not, it's not just it's not just me. <laughs> You're muted, Todd. Yeah, I'm uh, sorry about that. <laughs> Need another coffee this morning. I uh, <laughs> just wanted to say thanks again. It's such an important uh, topic. Uh, lots of folks uh, underappreciate, I think, the importance of uh, onboarding and it's uh, it, it's nice that there are some new tools out there and uh, artificial intelligence, et cetera, but uh, I'm really looking forward to your insights. Thank you, Todd. Looking forward to sharing with you today as well. Hi, Lisa, how are you? Hi, I'm great, thanks, good morning. Yeah, how's everyone? Good morning, good to see you again. Good, thanks. Thank you, yeah, I haven't been for a while, so it's nice to reconnect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and hopefully it'll be face-to-face uh, -face sometime, uh, Soon. Or, and mo more than screen-to-screen. -screen. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming. Sometime soon. I'm not sure why the audio's taking a while for Wendy and Nicole, um, but uh, I just want to make sure they can hear. I don't want to start if they can't hear anything. <laughs> Wendy and Nicole, if you can hear me, just write in the chat that you can hear, um, and then we can get started. So strange. We got Wendy. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, we might as well get started to kick things off. So uh, welcome to our talent network. Uh, the talent network is an opportunity for HR professionals to build a collaborative and supportive network in Brampton. Uh, this group focuses on important workplace issues, including employee appreciation, transit and community, wellness, safety, immigration, access to daycare, etc. cetera. Uh, Heather, uh, Ricketts, who I will introduce in a few minutes or a few seconds, uh, is here today to talk about onboarding, which is also a very hot topic amongst uh, this business community. I would also like to thank our sponsor, Sherard Coos Employment and Labor Lawyers. Uh, so to kick off, uh, we are here to introduce Heather, who has uh, gracefully accepted to present today. Uh, Heather is a strategic results-oriented HR leader who is skilled at designing talent man management programs that align people strategies with business goals. Heather has over 15 years of ex HR experience and has successfully delivered winning HR strategies in high growth companies across diverse sectors, including but not limited to retail, energy, manufacturing, and home services. Based on her successes, she has earned the reputation of trusted advisor and change champion. Prior to joining CDS, uh, Heather was the VP of Human Resources at O2E Brands, where she was accountable for setting the strategic direction for HR functions, including people operations, total rewards, talent acquisition, employee relations, organizational development, and equity, diversity, and inclusion. She has also served in senior leadership roles at Sleep Country Canada uh, and Maitri. I, I'm sorry if I said that wrong. <laughs> An avid traveler and a penchant for language, Heather has studied and worked in Japan, England, and Spain and speaks three languages fluently. 
Heather is a graduate of the University of Toronto where she obtained an honors Bachelor of Science degree in political science. She is certified human resource leader and holds a master's degree in labor and employment law from Osgoode Hall Law, law School, York University. In her free time, Heather volunteers with Camp Enterprise and World Class Jamaica, a charity she co-founded in 2016. So she has quite the resume, it's wonderful. E to E is very hard to say, if you've had to say it three times fast. <laughs> I was like, E to E, U to E. Uh, so welcome, yeah, it's Heather. It's a tongue twister. It it's is. Um, uh, but uh, what three languages? So is it Spanish? Like what? Spanish, what French, speak? and English. Japanese, I was a lot more fluent in when I lived there. Oh. Um, but I I haven't used it in several years. So I'm, oh. I'm a lot less So if, it, it if you off. heard it, would you pick up on it? <laughs> like if someone's talked to you in it? A lot, you yeah. But my, my comp, yeah, my comprehension would be about 40%, I would say. Oh, that's, yeah. that's. Because I feel like French, English, and Span or especially Spanish and French have a lot of similarities where I don't know about <laughs> Japanese. I'm sure it's a very different, complex language. So that's that's very cool. Uh, so yes, so Heather, if you want to kick off, uh, she has a presentation if you yeah. want to do a little intro um, and then I can yeah. kick things off with your presentation. Thank you, Jen, for the, thank you for the warm introduction. I appreciate <laughs> it and thank you for joining today, I'm I'm very humbled that you would join, uh, for join me for a talk on onboarding. I'm learning as I go, mm -hmm. and I think this would be a great opportunity for us to learn together about onboarding. Um, and welcome on the first Tuesday after a long weekend. I shouldn't have asked you, Jen, to to pronounce or say O2E <laughs> on a Tuesday <laughs> morning after a long weekend because you're just <laughs> rubbing up again after uh, having wound down and enjoyed some downtime. Mm -hmm. um, as I understand from what you shared with me, Jen, the previous sessions were around engaging and retaining talent. And that was amidst the great resignation, which is what we, the place that we all find ourselves in right now. And the reality is that no matter what uh, type of work environment you provide, no organization is exempt from the great resignation. And what that invariably means is that a lot of your talent is turning and that you're going to need to be replacing those roles with new talent. And as you bring new people on, you're going to need to onboard them effectively. Doing so in our new context, COVID context, um, does require thought. I think we've always needed to put thought and strategies in place for onboarding, but I think COVID has made the need to be strategic, particularly among the great resignation, that much more pronounced. And so during today's conversation, as I said, it's going to be a joint learning exercise and we're going to discuss strategies and tools and, and how you can use them to help you to onboard effectively. Um, I imagine you will have questions and answers. I'm going to answer them. <laughs> I'm going to do my best to answer them. What I would ask is if you can please note your questions and then there's a designated Q&A at the end if you'd like to ask them just because I want to move through the, move through, uh, the content and ensure I cover as much as I can. Um, during my time with you today. Are you able to uh, share the presentation, Jen? Yep. Um, also, I, I wanted to say quickly that um, Heather was recommended by our chair, Donna. Uh, she came highly recommended for today's presentation. So, <laughs> pressure's Thank on. You. Thank you, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you Do we, do you see it okay? I do see it, perfect. Okay. And, and I'll ask it. if you can please move to the next slide. Yep. All right, so this is me, if, sorry, back one. Yep, sorry. Yep, okay, <laughs> really thank fast. you. <laughs> so this is me, Jen introduced me um, as a trusted HR leader. My Myers-Briggs Briggs Protel, for those, of, for those of you who are familiar with it, is ESTJ. Um, if you're familiar with the predictive index, my profile is a strategist. I'm located in the city of Toronto. Uh, I love a number of things. It was difficult to narrow it down to just four, but in the interest of time, I'll share with you that my first love and passion is my charity that I co-founded in 2016, World Class Jamaica. We help schools in rural Jamaica by bridging barriers to access to proper infrastructure and technology. So the first picture is of me in my happy place with my kids. 
Uh, the second thing I absolutely love is learning. Um, constantly on a quest to learn and I'm deeply curious. The third thing I, I absolutely love is my Peloton. The hardest part is starting, but once I'm on it, I say I describe the Peloton and my outdoor bike as my happy place. And um, Ted Lasso, I'm watching uh, Ted Lasso for the third time on Netflix. I think it's brilliantly written. And each time I watch it, I catch, I catch new things. <laughs> and some fun facts about me are one that I learned to drive in reverse. My dad thought it was important that we all we, we learn to do things the hard way first. And so he taught all seven of his children, I'm the youngest of seven, to drive by driving in reverse. I also speak three languages fluently, which was mentioned. And I also mentioned I'm the youngest of seven children. So those, those are some fun facts about me. I figured that if you signed up, you would have possibly read my bio that you could learn about my work through, through LinkedIn. What, what does driving in reverse mean? It means that we didn't, we didn't put the car in drive for the first two months that my dad taught us to drive. It was always in reverse. So we would go into a parking lot, <sighs> and we would reverse around, <laughs> like we just reversed. We weren't allowed to drive forward for the first time. <laughs> So funny. <laughs> he said that if you can drive in reverse, you'll be a better driver. Um, <laughs> Maybe I should try that with my kids. <laughs> They're old enough. I, they'll be on a quest for adoption. Like they, okay. they, we, we were. We were. <laughs> <laughs> Don't try it. Don't try this at home. All right. If you can move to the next slide, Jen, please. That'd be awesome. Thank you. So two words. Um, Early on in the pandemic, I was with Matri and they, we had engaged a coach to facilitate sessions with the leadership to support us as we led ourselves and also led others through um, what I would describe as the destabilization and disruption that was COVID. And one of the facilitators said something that really landed with me. They said, connection before content. And connection before content was something that was important pre-COVID, the need, but I found that COVID uh, made the need to do so that much greater. And after she said this, I became a lot more intentional about building in connection points into my meeting. So whether it was one with ones or if it was a presentation, always doing a check-in. And the two word check-in is one of my, my favorite. It's a emotionally intelligent step that can often be missed. But when you simply ask, how are you? It's, it's more or less a rhetorical question because it's treated as part of a salutation and our reflex reaction to the question of how are you is I'm fine, even when it's not the case. So a more effective means of gauging how people are feeling is to kick off a meeting with a two word check-in. And it's effective because it gives people permission to name their feelings without feeling judgment but it also acknowledges um, that that humans are feel are that we're all human and that we're all at this particular juncture feeling many many things, and what people often describe um, or Brene Brown specifically she does two word check in in her meetings um, is the paradoxical paradoxical feelings and emotions that people feel. So you can feel exhausted, but at the same time be hopeful, and you can be weary, but at the same time be grateful. So I'd like to do a two word check in with this group and in the chat, ask you to name two emotions that you are presently feeling. Lisa's feeling excited and curious. Inspired and motivated, awesome. Curious and engaged. Love these, love these, love these. And so this gives you a good gauge. It's difficult to escape when um, really confronting or addressing or naming your true emotions when you're asked very specifically what those moments are. And this is a tool that I use and, and strongly encourage it as a means of connection. If you can move to the next slide. Uh, Jen, please. 
And I have two questions that I'd like to ask of you. I'm not going to put you on the spot and ask you to answer those aloud, but if you uh, wouldn't mind considering what is important for you to walk away with from today's session and why is this important to you? Uh, if you, you can capture this digitally on your computer if you'd like, or if you want to write it down manually, if you can take just a moment to think about what's important for you to walk away with from today's session and why it's important to you. Okay, as I said, I'm not going to put anyone on the spot, but I imagine if I were to ask uh, people in this group or participants to share their responses, there would be some similarities. I'm certain some of the reasons would be unique. But I think one, one reason uh, that I imagine would be common is the impact to the bottom line. Uh, and to improve retention, because there is a straight line between onboarding KPIs and your bottom line. So things like turnover, productivity, customer satisfaction, performance levels, those are all impacted by onboarding, but they also certainly have a direct line to your bottom line. And so for today's agenda, we're gonna cover four key points all at a high level because of the time constraints. But um, the first point is that we're going to look at articulating and expounding on the goals of onboarding. Uh, secondly, we're going to examine the four pillars of onboarding. From there, we're going to look at helping you diagnose your onboarding strategy level. And then we're going to look at some onboarding best practices from some leading organizations that do lead, lead in this space. So if you can go to the next slide, please. All right, so we're looking at the goals of onboarding. Okay, it's animated. So um, the first goal is to maximize, if you can press, yes, thank you. It's, it's to, this is by no means, I'll start by saying this is by no means an exhaustive list. It doesn't capture all of your goals. It's reflective of the goals, the key goals that you'd want to capture with, if your goal is to maximize both individual and organizational success. So the first goal is to maximize productivity. You really wanna help your new hires to adjust to not only the performance aspects of their jobs, but the social aspects so that they can quickly become productive and contributing members of the team. Right, the second goal is organizational socialization. And when you've hired the person, the assumption is that they have the knowledge, the skills needed to do the job. But really what you want to do is socialize them into the organization. And that includes things like attitudes and behaviors that are needed to function effectively in their new job. And although it seems glaringly obvious, um, the attitudes and behaviors, I think there's often the assumption that people will understand what's expected in that respect. And it's not always the case. Third goal is to fulfill your organizational goals and mission. So the faster new employees feel welcome and prepared for their jobs is the faster they'll be able to successfully contribute to the organization mission and goals. And the fourth goal is to increase engagement and to increase commitment. You wanna develop committed, successful, mutually beneficial um, relationships as soon as possible. So connect deeply, quickly is how I would describe uh, one of your primary goals of onboarding. And all of this is to achieve the ultimate end of, of maximizing success. You can go to the next slide. So I'm gonna do a quick poll 
uh, how confident are you in your ability to distinguish between onboarding and orientation? So on a 10 point scale, I'm gonna ask you to enter in the chat. How confident you are, what number reflects your level of comfort with, in your ability to distinguish between onboarding and orientation? From one to 10, it's on a 10 point scale. One being like low confidence and 10 being, we got this, I can teach the course. So that's got a two, Lisa's put a four. I wonder if this would, be reflective of the what I, I believe to be the truth of people be, who are brilliant evaluating themselves really low on a thing. That's what I've been taught that people who are exceptional at things tend to evaluate themselves at, at a lower level than their actual capabilities. All right, so I'm I'm somewhat flattered that you chose uh, such low numbers because I was concerned that you might be insulted by my next slide. <laughs> you need to go over to the next slide, Jen, please. So I think on its face, it just would appear very simple that onboarding and orientation are really, I mean, it's so obvious what the distinction is. And I, I do think that some things are glaringly obvious, but there are some things that are nuanced. And while there are um, seven points listed on this slide, I won't go through each of these in detail. Um, but I will speak to some of the points that I feel are slightly more nuanced. So when you're looking at, at content of onboarding versus the content of orientation, what orientation focuses on is the formal pieces, like your, your policies, your organizational, your vision, mission, guidelines. Whereas onboarding, one of the key things you're getting from it is insights from managers, mentors, and coworkers. And it's very position specific. It's not something, it's not a template that you're replicating um, for all your employees across the organization. Um, another thing that stands out is communication and one way versus two way. And I think you'll look at that and say, well, isn't it obvious our onboarding is a two-way interactive process, but it's about really looking deep and, and, and getting a sense of what direction the communication is flowing in for the, the bulk of the time. Is it, is it uh, mostly downward or is it truly a two-way process where you're receiving uh, feedback and engaging in regular touch points with your new hire? Another thing is the time period. So orientation is one of those things, if you're doing it, it lasts for a day to the first few weeks. Onboarding is actually a 12 to 18 month process. It takes that long to truly integrate your employees and onboard them into your organization. Another key thing is your facilitator. So your orientation program guaranteed is run by your HR team and the immediate manager. Whereas onboarding is sort of like a 360 process that that involves managers, mentors, peers, coworkers, everyone is involved in onboarding the employee. So there is really, there are some distinctions, won't go through all of them, but what I would encourage you to do is to use this visual and assess your current onboarding program against this. And how you do that is hold your program up as though you're looking through a mirror and ask questions such as content, our insights built into our program. And this isn't something that you do at a glance. It is gonna require a dive, but are we building insights from managers and peers into our program so that people can get a deeper understanding of our organization? When we look at our facilitation, is it simply HR that's facilitating this in the manager or, or do we have mentors built into our program? Do we have coworkers um, that help to facilitate things. And if not, this is an opportunity for you to explore ways or touch points that you can add 
other people so that your onboarding is more of a 360 approach than it is um, a straight line between HR and the employee or manager and the employee or your new hire, sorry. And next slide. So when you juxtapose onboarding and orientation, it's very clear that onboarding is focused on the integration and the employee experience, whereas the focus of orientation is to address the formal compliance component. And this is not a knock to orientation at all by any means, because there are aspects of orientation that are absolutely necessary. So we need to be compliant. However, if you focus exclusively on orientation in the traditional sense, you're fulfilling only the first of the four C's of onboarding, which is compliance. And that's level one, that's like bare minimum, you're at the floor, not the ceiling. Next slide, please. Really what you want to do is move from compliance to clarification. And why? Next slide, Jen, is because clear is kind. This is another Brene Brown quote. I should have put, put Brene Brown under things I love because I truly do love Brene Brown. You'll hear me quote her often. Um, but she says, clear is kind, unclear is unkind. And clarification is really about ensuring that new hires clearly understand their job and what's needed to excel. What I'd also say is that the reverse is also true. So clearly understanding um, what the new hires are here to do on the part of the organization. I'd also say for the organization, you need to be clear on what your employees' needs are. And if you could press enter, Jen, this is an animated slide. What you'll see I've posted here is the expectations conversation. And I'm calling it out because we take for granted that it happens, but it doesn't always happen. In fact, it often doesn't happen. And this is one of the things that leads to um, a less than successful onboarding program. The expectation conversation asks at a minimum, these three basic questions. What does your new hire need to do in the short term and in the medium term? Two, what will constitute success? And three, how will performance be measured and by when? The expectations conversation is one of five critical conversations that um, Harvard onboarding um, experience expert, Michael Watkins recommends. And he says, you wanna have this conversation very on in the onboarding process within the first six weeks and make sure you have the conversations, expectations are clear and that there is alignment. The, are, the other four conversations, which we won't get into today, but I would say are equally important to have during the onboarding process is the situational diagnosis, which is where you speak with your boss about your perception of your portfolio and where you're at as a company. Um, the resource conversation, which is understanding what is what resources are needed to be successful. You want to have a style conversation, which is about how you can best interact um, on an ongoing basis. And a personal development conversation where you get aligned on developmental priorities after several months. But to achieve the second C of your four C's of onboarding, which is clarification, this expectations conversation is what you you need to have. Moving on to the next slide. Once you've got clarification down pat, we proceed to culture. If you can press enter again, this is a tricky slide. I, if I can have a very honest moment, I was struggling with the animations on this slide. So I apologize in advance if uh, the animations don't come in, in the order that I'd hoped. And I was asked the question, what is culture when I was in an interview once? And I really thought about it. I, I, I don't know that I was um, incredibly proud of my response, but it, it caused me to sit back and really think and examine what culture truly is and how it's defined. This is a definition that really, uh, that really landed with me. So this is the one I'm choosing to share. There are multiple definitions out there, but it's defined as a set of consistent patterns people follow for communicating thinking and acting all grounded in their shared assumptions and values. 
and the equity, diversity, and inclusion definition of culture is what's expected, valued, and rewarded. And if you can um, press enter again for me, Jen, and again. Thank you. So when you look at this, you'll see in this diagram that culture is multi-layered. And at the top of the pyramid, you see things that are visible that could easily be captured with a camera. These are like your symbols and languages, like what are the logos, what's the dress code, what's the office layout, highly visible. You don't necessarily need someone to guide you or direct you in understanding what those highly visible things are. The middle layer of culture speaks to norms and patterns of behavior. And you'll see that, um, there are both visible and hidden elements in the middle layer. And things that are hidden are things like, how do you get support for important initiatives? How do we win recognition in this organization for accomplishments? How are meetings held? And these norms and patterns are very difficult to discern and become only evident after you spent some time in the new environment. And then the bottom layer um, is that speaks to fundamental assumptions and values. And it's taken for granted that, you know, pe people who've been with the organization for a long time um, might feel that it's easily learned through osmosis, right? You, you, you just know these things. And I think, you know, if you've been in an organization for a long time, you're sort of like a fish swimming in your own water. Like you don't even know, you're just acclimatized to, to the culture. So you don't even know what makes your culture distinct or unique. You don't even know what your assumptions and values are and how they might be different from others. And things like the way the world works or the way power is distributed is not going to be uh, necessarily obvious to someone who's coming in from outside of your organization. And so this is why it's very important as you build your onboarding programs to make sure you're tackling culture, not just at the top of the pyramid, but particularly for your senior leaders and or people who are going to be leading people in decision-making authority that, that you're tackling and speaking to the hidden pieces of the pyramid. If you can go to the next slide, please. And what you're doing is making um, the, the explicit implicit. I apologize again, I was having struggle, struggles with this, that particular side. So thank you for bearing with me. And um, again, clear is kind. How you identify cultural norms are by looking at six domains in which cultural norms vary widely from company to company. And so ensure that you answer your new hires questions with clarity on each of these domains so that they know how things work when they join the organization and they can avoid making any full pause. So the six domains are influence, which is like, how do you get support for critical initiatives? Execution, what takes precedence, knowing the right people or following process? Recognition, meetings, conflict, the end versus the means. Um, and I'll give you an example, right? Conflict. I was a part of an organization that I would describe as having very much a conflict avoidant culture. And so if there was a divergent opinion or viewpoint, it was never expressed in the meeting. You would maybe have a sidebar conversation, but conflict was not something that was ever engaged in, and I know there are other words used for conflict now, like direct conversations, radical candor, but that didn't exist in that, that environment. And a new executive had joined and was very direct in, in, in the first few meetings. And I, I knew there was chatter behind the scenes, like, uh, I don't think he's gonna last long here. But I thought, you know, how much more effective would it be if we built the identification of these cultural norms into the process, the onboarding process. So feedback on these things isn't given reactively. I think people are more, more prone to 
shame and embarrassment when you know, you're calling them out on a conflict after they found themselves in a conflict situation or when they wanted to move something forward with influence but didn't do so effectively. If you are able to make these implicit things explicit early in the process as it relates to cultural norms, you increase your chances of having a successful onboarding and integration experience for your newly onboarded people. And I know these are things you're like, we do this, we do this, trust me. Um, the research shows that most organizations fall apart on really naming and calling these things out for their new hires. And these are things that are critically important to success. And the fourth of the four C's is connection. So at it's the highest level um, of, that the employee develops relationships with other members of the organization. We spend half of our lives, sorry, a third of our lives and half of our waking hours at work. So we really wanna um, get people to, to know each other on a personal level, level and improve how people um, collaborate because connected teams drive collaborations. And what you see on the slide in front of you is Oh, Heather, we lost you. <laughs> oh, it was doing so good. It wasn't even like cutting out. <laughs> she might have to log in and log out. Yeah, hopefully she notices if she's focusing on the slide, she might not focus on the I fact. I know. That well, she hears us. Like all the information is amazing too. I can see you making notes. <laughs> <laughs> she just logged off, so she'll probably come back in. I think this is the perfect time. I have a client that needs this right now. Oh, good. I uh, have been thinking about a question, Lisa, and I'm interested in your thoughts. Um, what criteria should we have to determine if a meeting, a forum, a network should be done virtually or in real life? Should we bias? Should, should, is it speaker dependent, topic dependent? Should we always have a bias for in real life? Any thoughts on that? I think just looking at this word connection right on the screen here, that I think maybe it's more of a cadence of, of making sure that we do have con in-person connections, maybe every three meetings or something. Mm -hmm. Because people do like, and I do like the idea of jumping online, not having to get ready, not having to, to drive. And like that, that piece, we can't lose sight of the fact that we, that the convenience of this is amazing. Um, but then also just, it, injecting the connection in there, the in-person connection, and maybe make that those meetings more of a less topic specific or less topic intense and more um, connection and sharing each other's wisdoms and, and being able to um, learn from each other, like, like a group think. Because mm -hmm. we learn a lot that way too, from each other. Yeah, yeah that, was, that was talked about, we were thinking of having, you know, three, every fourth network be a, like an in-person and it be more um, informal than formal based. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. But not a free for all and not like a, just a just to network or just to talk, like have very specific things to share and prepare. Mm -hmm. topics. Mm -hmm. Because um, I, and I, I'm, I'm listening intently for your rationale for that and networking means oh looks like we're heading heading back into the uh, the session we'll, we'll continue this conversation sure. later <laughs> you're back i apologize my power went out for a minute sorry about that oh that's okay <laughs> we were saying or like everything was so good like your connection looked so good and then all of a sudden it just stopped so i guess yeah power makes sense 
I promise it wasn't on purpose. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I apologize. I have to make up for that two minutes there, three minutes. Oh, was. no worries. Okay. Okay, go ahead. All right. So I'm continuing on from here. So connection, what you see on this slide is um, Gallup has identified three characteristics of a well-connected team. And these are the foundations. So trust, teamwork, and emotional loyalty. And um, trust is confidence in one another's, is defined here as confidence in one another's reliability and dependability. Teamwork as they've defined it uh, from a connection perspective is an appreciation of one another's talent strengths and can tackle um, challenge, their ability to tackle challenges together. And the third emotional loyalty is described as loyalty to the team. It's passionate, expressive, expressive and deep seated. And when all of these elements are in place, you maximize both um, loyalty uh, in terms of uh, your ability to retain talent but you also maximize innovation and productivity. And so when you look at these things, um, the question to ask is how do I design and build these things into my onboarding and orientation programs and beyond for my team members? Uh, next next uh, slide. And connection questions, these are just a few that you can ask um, your teams. I would, I would suggest uh, with these that that you ask these in one-on-one -on -one forums with your team members. These are questions that will give you insights because connection I think is something that's very unique to people and what you may see as a connection point, members of your team don't. And so you want to be able to get to the heart of what matters for your team members in terms of connection and determining how you can help them to build productive relationships at work. So build both lateral and vertical relationships. And I'm gonna be sharing this deck as well. So um, if you'd like to capture these questions, these are questions that I would strongly encourage you to ask during touch points as a means of achieving that number four, that high level. So moving on to the next slide, I wanted to do a quick check-in just to see this is a, I didn't tell you there was gonna be a quiz, but there's a quiz. What are, the four C's. You can throw it in the chat. I'm putting you on the spot. Thanks for posting the answers, Jen. You got it. I mean, Jen's helping everyone. I love Jen. Like I should have, I should have had a Jen in my class when I was in high school. She would have allowed me to look over her shoulder. It's too late to go back in time. It's okay. <laughs> Alrighty, I'll take you out of your misery. The four C's. Next slide, Jen. Are compliance, clarification, culture, connection. And all of these, how you would evaluate yourself on each of these or how you score on each of these determines the level of experience that your employees will have, but also your onboarding strategy level. So as an example, I've taken um, one organization as an example, and you know they diagnosed their strategy level. They said, look, when we look at our compliance, we're good. We're following all of the, um, we have all of our policies in place. Clarification, um, we're good as well. Like our new hires know what success is. They know how performance is measured. They know their short and long-term expectations. So we're green, we're checking off the green box for compliance. For culture, however, we're gonna evaluate ourselves as, as somewhat there. We're gonna give ourselves a yellow um, because you know, from a culture perspective, we cover all the things that were at the top of the pyramid you know, we share the vision, the mission, the logos, the acronyms, but we don't share the values and the assumptions. And we don't speak about things like influence, conflict, or execution. And on connection, I'd say we're only partway there because we do the two-word check-in when we have time, and that's maybe at 20% of our meetings. But beyond the two-word check-in, we don't really build connection, deep connection points in, in our uh, onboarding, certainly not in the way that Gallup has defined it or you know, what would be considered exceptional. 
So in this case, the organization, if you could press enter again, Jen, would be evaluated at a level two. And I'm gonna share this template with you. So you're, you know, you're more than welcome to look at it. It's not something I'd expect you to be able to really evaluate effectively today, but I'd encourage you to take this away and look at these four elements in your organization. Hold your onboarding program against it and, and evaluate where you're at as it relates to compliance, clarification, culture, and connection. Now, if you could go to the next slide, Jen, please. You'll see the four levels here. The first level, which is the lowest level where they're only, they've only achieved success in one of the um, four areas. They've, they've touched on compliance, but haven't really um, met their employees' needs as it relates to clarification, culture, connection, or experience. They're at level one, which is a passive level. Level two, where they've achieved two of the four Cs, uh, would be deemed high potential. Level three, which is um, where they've achieved, uh, should, sorry, that should be three. This is my mistake here. It should be three, would be considered proactive. And four, where they've, can, where they've satisfied all four, they would have the ultimate ex experience-driven onboarding program. They would, they would see a huge business uh, impact. And really what we're aiming for is that level four experience. And I'm gonna do a quick poll on the next slide. Where, where do you feel your organization falls on the four stage maturity level? Would you be a level one, which is passive, level two, high potential, three, proactive, or four, experience driven? Two. Okay. Any others? Okay. Well, you know what? If you're a two, you're in very good company because the, in, the industry sh stats show that approximately half of organizations are at level two, 34% are at level three, and only 8% are at level one. Um, so I don't think the fact that the majority are there makes it great. It just means you're not alone in this and that there are opportunities across most organizations to, um, to grow or be more strategic in their onboarding of their employees. And if you can move to the next slide. The goal is really to build an experience-driven onboarding model that incorporates all four Cs and puts the most impactful C at its core, which is human connection, and uses experiences to spark connection. And I know you're gonna ask me, how do you do this? This is a lot of work. <laughs> uh, you go to the next slide, you do this, you get to do this effectively, you're gonna need to put your experience tinted glasses on or your design thinking glasses on. So if you can go to the next slide, you'd, you'd probably, you may have seen something like this. It's an empathy map or um, that, that's often used for customers. But what I say is that your uh, employee, your customer experience will never exceed your employee experience. So you can design a way for your customers and, and contemplate what you want them to, to be thinking, feeling, doing, and saying. If you don't do similar for your employees, you will miss, you'll be missing out on an opportunity to maximize their experience. So when you put your empathy or your design thinking experience tinted glasses on, you're looking, you're, you're filtering it through a design thinking lens and you're asking, even on the compliance side, how might we improve the experience for our new hires who, who are reading health and safety information? How might we improve the experience of reading and signing forms? And you ask, what do we want our employees to be thinking, feeling, doing, and saying? What are their pains? And what are some gains that we can help them to realize? And if you go to the next slide, I've put an example here of some things that we might want our employees to be thinking, feeling, doing, and saying. Some of this may, may be what you would, you would want or hope to see in your organization. Um, some of the things might be unique to your organization, but this is just 
to serve as a sample of some questions or some points that you might want to consider. So um, on the thinking side, you want your employees to be thinking, I know what's expected of me. I feel supported. I see where I can add value. You want them to be feeling a sense of purpose, uh, belonging and connection, and to feel supported. What you want them to be doing is aligning on expectations, building effective relationships. And what we want them to be saying is that I can see myself working here for a long time and I feel connected. These are some examples. I'm not presumptuous enough to assume that this is what you want for your organization. But if I were to hazard a guess, I, I, would, I would imagine that many organizations would want this to be the experience for their employees. You can go to the next slide. But I would say a goal without a plan is a wish. That's one of my favorite um, quotes. One of my other favorite quotes is by James Clear and it says, you don't rise to the level of your, your highest goals, you fall to the level of your systems. And so you can wish for your employees to have that experience where they're feeling supported and connected and saying that they wanna be here for a very long time. But if you don't design a system or build that into your onboarding system, it's not gonna just happen. You can't will it. You've got to build for it. So if you can go to the next slide, what you'll see I've designed here is just a part of an employee journey map. So it starts at attraction, moves through onboarding and goes all the way to exit. And while today we're talking about onboarding and what we want our employees to be doing, thinking, feeling, and saying, I think it's important to consider this across your employee's journey. And if you look um, just below, the six points on the employee journey, you'll see there's sentiment there. And you'll notice that the sentiment moves as employees go on their journey between positive and negative. And while this journey isn't reflective of everybody's journey, it's actually quite reflective of the, the, the typical employee's um, sentiment during, during their journey. And you'll notice that onboarding is at the, low, the lowest sentiment, even lower than exit for many is during onboarding. And this is a term that's referred to as the dip. And it's very, very common. And during the dip, employees will question often their decision to join. When you're early and in integrating into a new company, you might question your, your competence or your abilities. And some of the things that contribute to this is failure to address some of this, the six domains that I had spoken about earlier on things like influence, conflict. If, if a new hire cuts their teeth enough <laughs> um, and, and receives feedback reactively, it can really trigger uh, shame and embarrassment, but also for them to question their sense of worth, worthiness and belonging. And that will drive that negative sentiment that you see there. So as you look on this employee journey empathy map, you'll see that there are touch points there. And I'd encourage you to, um, as a leadership team, do a visioning exercise or even bring your managers or frontline employees on board. This could be a collaborative organizational effort. Let's to build out an empathy map for the onboarding part of our employee journey. What do we want people to be doing, thinking, feeling, saying, and what are our touch points? So if, as an example, um, we know at onboarding, employees are gonna be experiencing a dip, what do we do to address this? And Disney does something that's absolutely brilliant is they assign a coach during onboarding. This could be a cultural adaptation coach that speaks to you about the dip before you get there and makes themselves available to you to help you navigate that point because chances are you're not alone in having experienced the dip. If we can move to the next slide, please. Again, when I talk about building it into the system, I haven't built this out because I do truly feel that this is unique to you. But as you build your system, which is critical, you can't just will a solid onboarding system. There should be accountability established at every, every level. Otherwise it defaults to being the HR program, which is so not. Um, you wanna look at your executive. What is the executive's accountability and role? And it could be to establish and communicate an onboarding vision. It could be to review a, a monthly onboarding dashboard. But you need to establish clearly as an executive team what your accountability is. Your managers, what is their accountability as it relates to onboarding? Individual contributors and your new hires. If you'll notice, I didn't put HR here because I, I, do, I do not think that onboarding is, is HR's responsibility, actually. I think we can help you, support you with the design, 
but it's it's truly um, a 360, 360 process. And if you can move to the next slide, I'm going to quickly run through the, the, some onboarding best practices, as um, I had mentioned earlier in the presentation. The Simpsons is my all-time favorite cartoon, one of my favorite TV shows of all time, so I had to find a way of inserting Bart here, but I will adopt best practices. So I'm not going to touch on all four C's. I'm just going to give best practices that touch on three of the three of the C's. If you can go to the next slide. First is connection. Just a few very quickly. You saw at the beginning that I shared that about me slide. If you can go to the next slide, Jen, please. Yeah, at the beginning. This is um, the about me from one of the members of my team. And how we use this was before someone started, we would provide them with a blank template and they could fill in their information. They inserted their picture, they shared the things they love, some quick facts. And we use the PI as our psychometric test and people would, um, would insert their PI profile. What we also did was shared all of, shared our personal bio cards. All of the, sorry, all of the team members shared their personal bio cards before the person joined. So they were building connections and understanding um, members of their teams even before they felt up, even before they joined the organization. So that sense of belonging and connection was established before. Next slide, please. I don't know if I'll be able to get through everything, but I'm going to try to cover some as, as many as I can as quickly as possible. I'll be sharing this deck as well, so you can see this. It's a personal coat of arms, and. You can use whatever six items you want. Um, we chose to look at things like something that you're trying to improve, something that you're good at, three words to describe you, um, and what your dream job is. And this is something you can do early on in the onboarding process. It's something that you can do with team members who've been with you for a long time. But connecting beyond what's on your resume is really something that helps to foster connection and belonging. And next slide. Something, I, a tool that I think is absolutely brilliant and can be used with your people who've been with you for a long time, as well as new hires, is the personal user manual. And the, in this manual, it's just how do you navigate your relationship with me? And you can't take for granted that people know how you operate, what your triggers are, what your strengths are, how you learn best. I think it's really, again, clear as kind, making the implicit explicit and calling out what you value. Uh, how you like to receive feedback, how you learn best, what are the things that you need, and what's your work cadence. For example, on my personal user manual, I say that I prefer to focus on deep work in the morning and schedule meetings in the afternoon. If I call that out early enough, or if you're able to get this insight from your new hire, then it will help you as you um, engage, engage with them. Um, next on the connection piece as an ambassador or coach. And this again is, I think it serves a benefit in terms of connection, but also culture. And it's answering those questions on the six domains that I've mentioned. How do I give the unwritten rules? Like, is it that we go far together, not fast alone? How do we build constructive relationships? What are some of the barriers to delivering results? So, you know, these are some things, and there's more that, you know, there are questions. If you, if there's a really great book written by Michael Dotkins called My First 90 Days, there are some really powerful questions that the coach can help to answer for your new hire. I know we're at time, Jen. Am I able to go um, three minutes or five minutes over or? Yep, okay. So I'm going to try to go through the rest as quickly as possible because there are some pretty cool tools that I'd love to share with the group. Apologies for the delay. Culture. Um, on the next slide, you'll see there's a culture adaptation checklist. And this speaks to the six domains that I had mentioned to you. Again, when you've been with the organization for a long time, you're like a fish swimming in your own waters. You don't know really at the bottom of the pyramid, like what are the values? What are the assumptions? So you want to make sure you build into your onboarding process that that cultural adaptation checklist where you have the influence questions, the meetings, the execution, and you actually check off when you've satisfied those. Those should be built in when you're looking, you're building your onboarding program and you have your empathy map and you, you write down what the touch points are, there should certainly be a cultural adaptation checklist integrated in there. 
You also want to add on the next slide, you'll see a 360 degree check-in. And this is, again, early in the process. You don't need to wait till someone is two years in to invest in that check-in. Early on, if, if people can see where their blind spots opportunities are and where they're performing well, it really um, pays dividends and helps to, to maximize their integration and success. The next slide is the 100 day plan. Um, there are two brilliant books, um, one written by Michael Dawkins called My First 90 Days. I can't recommend that book enough. Um, and the second book is My First 100 Days. They give you really good uh, content that can you, you can include in your onboarding plan. And the next is an onboarding passport. Similar to the, the um, 100 day plan or your onboarding plan, the onboarding passport was something that I used at Matree, or we used at Matree for our new hires on the hourly side. And what we, we called it a passport because we treated our onboarding as though it was a journey that people were on. It wasn't a spot on the road. And we, we brought um, cultural ambassadors or onboarding ambassadors to support any new hire. So if you came in, you were assigned an ambassador that was yours to help you. And I think what was strategic about that is we didn't leave who the primary influence was to chance. We wanted to make sure that um, the, the person influencing perspective um, and, and welcoming the employee was someone that, that was a great representative of our culture and um, would help the employee navigate their way through challenges effectively. And if you go to the next slide, I'll share some of the contents with you. It was a, a book that was just under 100 pages, so I'm not able to share everything, but as an example, um, we shared our Matree promise and we shared um, what our expectations were. So as an example, you will be treated with respect and fairness. We are committed to working together to create a self health and safety workplace. You will have a voice. And then there was their promise, the new hires promises to treat others with respect and value their contributions. And, and another of other promises uh, were listed. And then if you go to the next slide, we also built in not just the culture pieces, but we built in clarity in there. So every day for the first two weeks, there was a learning and feedback section in the onboarding passport. So they, they would highlight learnings from today, focus for tomorrow, supervisor feedback, and signatures were required by both the employee and the supervisor. And what they were learning was mapped out. So if you look at the left side um, of this uh, particular page, you'll see that there was knee safety covered, lockout, tagout, hazardous communications. They knew what, they could always uh, know what was coming on the next day because it was included in the passport and they could always do a look back and review. The next C clarification, really quickly, um, this, this, the first exercise is one of my favorites. And this was something that was done at O2E Brands, which is the parent company for 1-800-GOT-JUNK. The co-founder, Brian, believed very much in manifesting. If you could go to the next slide, um, Jennifer. So it's a, it was a vision exercise. And, and Brian did uh, what was called a painted picture, which is where it was a future look, where he was manifesting where we wanted to be. So it was a visualization of even where we wanted to celebrate. And this, this, this particular one was a, a trip in Hawaii. And in the painted picture um, at, at, at Got Junk, there are things like appearing on the Oprah show, appearing on Ellen, what the employee's experience is gonna look like, what engagement is gonna look like. And I gotta tell you, there's something about the power of manifesting because things that were manifested on the vision uh, exercise or in the painted picture did come, did actually come to light, including the Oprah show and the Ellen appearances. But what we did was with every new hire, we would share the painted picture with them in advance of a cohort onboarding session. And then we would get them to highlight the parts of the painted picture that um, they felt that they or their department inflicted, impacted directly and to look ahead and see what specifically they could do. And then as a follow-up, we encourage them to discuss the highlighted areas with their managers. So if you were designing on an employee journey map, the vision exercise is something that you can include. And maybe your organization doesn't have a painted picture, but you might have a vision, you might have a strategy. 
It doesn't have to be a painted picture, but you can look at, get your new hires to look at the strategy and, and highlight their role in helping to fulfill that. I won't go through the rest. There are two more pieces, um, but they speak to clarification. It's a situational diagnosis, a STAR model. It's in um, Michael's book, uh, My First 90 Days. And it's really about identifying where you're at, whether you're a startup, turnaround, accelerated growth, realignment, or sustaining success. This is, this is useful for uh, executive and senior leaders. If you go to the next slide, um, the situational diagnosis model, it's Ken Blanchard's book. I think this is certainly more useful for your entry and mid-level leaders. And in onboarding, you wanna to come to an alignment early enough on the level and types of support that you're going to provide, whether it's delegating, supporting, coaching, or directing. And last slide, I'm just whipping through these things. I'd say perfection is the enemy of progress. So rather than looking at this huge elephant and trying to determine how you're gonna eat the whole thing, uh, you know, I, I would suggest that you ask, what is, ask yourself, what is the one thing that you can commit to doing today to help purport, propel you forward on your journey to onboarding excellence? You don't have to answer immediately. You'll have some time to reflect, but I don't, I'd encourage you, you know, to contemplate that today while all of this information is still fresh and consider what you can do because it, we really make the progress one step at a time. I use stairs very intentionally to describe it as it's just truly, it truly is about taking one step at a time. And next and last slide is, may we our ends by our beginning no. And that's a quote by John Denham. So thank you very much uh, for, for joining me today. I'm humbled that you joined me. I hope that you were able to get some value and insights from today's presentation. And I know I'm past time, but I am available to answer any questions that anyone has or to share um, if anyone would like to. No, we can take a question or so. Lisa, okay. if, anybody, if you have a question, take like one or two. Oh, thank you. That was an amazing presentation. So much content and just a rich, a deep level to, to work thank with. Uh, so my question, I have two, but the first one would be in your experience, um, how intense is that process when you do look at those six identifying norms and companies have to reflect and look, hey, how do we have influence here? How do we execute? And, and they may really, it may be very uncomfortable. How, how do you handle that? And how much can you really expect them to come to some sort of consensus? What's the realistic that they can come to some sort of consensus? Very good question. And I think that's in part um, determined by the conflict nature of the culture. So that's actually built into the culture itself. So you know one of the sixes is conflict. Are we willing to go? And so I, I, if, it, if it's a conflict of winning culture, I would ask a very difficult question. Is are we willing to lean in here and to address some things that might be uncomfortable? And I would also suggest as you design it, if you want to design it effectively, you bring in people who are newly onboarded to help design it because people who've been there forever don't necessarily have that perspective. Like they're, they are the fish that are swimming in their own waters. They don't know what the values and assumptions are. And I think we need to, what I do personally is I love the radical candor model, which talks about caring deeply and challenging directly. So if the culture is a conflict avoiding culture, I actually take out that radical candor um, model and before embarking on the conversation, say, these are the four quadrants. We need, if we want to get the most value of this conversation today, we need to be in that top domain where we're caring deeply, challenging directly, and this is not personal. Let's go there because this is how we're going to maximize the value. And we, we get called out and we do our check-ins at the end just to make sure everyone's okay. But very good question. I think it's a conversation that needs to happen for sure. Yeah, and I'm assuming it's going to be messy. And I'm assuming it doesn't come to some crystal clear consensus. Like we have to work with kind of a messy, murky, um, maybe not, but tell me, tell me, like what, what level of consensus do you think people could, could get to? I think, I think you can get to high consensus. And I, I, I do, I, I see, but I, I do think, um, again, it's tied to your culture. And I think for some CEOs, they may take it personally. I think it's hard to not take it personally because a lot of times CEOs own the cultural tone, but it's it's perhaps, it may require some prepping for that. If you anticipate um, that there may be some egos bruised, 
to say like if the cost of not doing this is greater than the cost to your ego in this moment, right? Like that it's we've got to, we've got to pay that price. I'd rather pay that price than the price of a turned executive because a turned executive is very expensive, right? So it's messy. I won't say it's not messy, but I don't know progress that's been achieved without digging in to some mess. I, I just don't. And so I think you got to okay. be prepared to go there. Yeah. Like that. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Good question. Well, Heather, I thought uh, your uh, presentation was very good. And uh, you mentioned radical candor. It's uh, been mm -hmm. sitting on my uh, night table. I haven't opened it yet. So now I will. Now, now I will. I definitely uh, will. But uh, some great uh, tools uh, that uh, you had in your presentation. And, uh, you know, I think particularly for onboarding, it's, uh, it's so important to uh, set a welcoming, comfortable and uh, tone. You, you know, you talked from the beginning about expectations. And uh, I liked how you finished as well uh, uh, perfection is uh, the enemy of, uh, of progress uh, you know during COVID the last couple of years uh, uh, there's been temptation uh, to to say good is good enough and sometimes we've had to say that because we've been stretched in so many ways um, uh, but sometimes good enough doesn't inspire right doesn't inspire your staff uh, they need to know that you're uh, you've got a standard of, of, of excellence, uh, and I think that's important in the, uh, the onboarding. So I just think uh, you provided so many different tools that allowed nuance uh, to be un better understood, and th that cultural component is so important because there's no hard and ru fast rules uh, on, in onboarding. Uh, it, it really has to take in the, the context of what the environment uh, uh, is in the industry and uh, in, 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 in the workplace. So, so thanks. Uh, there are lots of really, really good tools there. You're welcome. You're welcome. I'm glad you got, I'm, rather, I'm glad you got use or you see usefulness in the tools. I appreciate that. Fantastic. Well, great. Well, I'm so happy that this has been recorded. I know that our, uh, our members will be very interested in, uh, in viewing this. And uh, Jen, did you want to take us home? Yeah, so thank you, Heather, again. Uh, if you wanted to send me your presentation, like I think you said you wanted to share it, then I can share it with those, uh, at least if you wanted, I can email it to you. Uh, so just a few little housekeeping. Our next uh, talent network is going to be on April 5th with Matthew Bedrove from Sherard uh, um, Coos, uh, who are our sponsors. So he will be um, attending to talk about employment, an employment law update. Uh, he came on uh, probably near the end of last year just to kind of talk about, you know, what is happening within the laws of COVID, employment, and what that looks like from a legal perspective. So he's gonna be coming on again to talk about, to give a little update, lessons learned from 2021 and how um, you can move forward for 2022. So yeah, April 5th and in a few, well, next week, March 2nd is, is our Inspy Her event. Uh, it's um, celebrating women and inspirational women in our business community, uh, Donna, will be hosting um, and she will be awarding the, the Nassim Somania Memorial Leadership Excellence Award to Dr. Janet Morrison, the President and Vice Chancellor of Sheridan College. As well, we have a keynote speaker, the Honorable Kamel Kara, the Minister of Seniors. So she'll be on to talk about her experiences and uh, the theme of our Inspire Her in as well as International Women's Day this year is Breaking the Bias. So that is gonna be uh, the topic of our Inspire Her event. Uh, so it is virtual, so we hope that you can attend. Um, also continuing on the theme of breaking the bias as well as International Women's Day on March 9th, which is the day after International Women's Day on March 8th, we will be inviting Pink Attitude to come in and do a presentation presentation, <laughs> presentation on the changing face of Canada's workforce. Uh, so we will be having three very important women join us to have a panel discussion. We'll have our chair, Donna Fagan pascal the counselor, Rowena Santos, and uh, the director of Ryerson's Venture Zone, Usha Serena Vason. And they will be there to uh, talk about South Asian women in the Canadian workplace, the challenges and opportunities that they face. 
Uh, so that is on March 9th. It's in conjoined with our Connect Work Network. So I think it's gonna be a great one to attend. Also, Business Excellence Awards is on May 5th. Nominations are out there, open. The form is online. Also, uh, so the, that is the deadline's coming up in March. May 5th is our big event. It's gonna be in person. It's at the Pearson Convention Center. Should be a great evening. If you're looking forward, looking to attend and you have questions, please reach out to myself and I will get those answers for you. But yeah, if you can think of any businesses or as well as yourself that you want to nominate, please check out the nomination form and submit when you can. There you go. <laughs> but thank you again, Heather, for attending today. And if you could send me your presentation. And yeah, so thank you for those who came out this morning. I'd be happy to do that. Yeah, thank you everyone for participating. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you, Lisa. Thank